Welcome to our webinar, Costumes and Customs. Um, I'm Carrie O'Flynn. As Madeline said, I've been involved with the um, Ellen Hutchins Festival for the last couple of years. Um, I'm a historical reenactor and living historian, um, and I have been probably doing this for, I would say, um, all of my adult life, basically. Um, I would like to point out, however, that I'm not a professional historian. This is actually um, something I do um, as a passion project. Um, I have a full-time job and all of my um, reenactment clothing and my uh, research is done uh, in my spare time. Great. Um, so, um, I'm sure we've all seen movies with dashing, heroic menfolk looking handsome in a wool tail coat or a vivacious young Regency miss exchanging pleasantries while dressed in a flowing white dress. But what were Regency clothes really like? And how were they made? Hopefully I'll be able to answer those questions for you and more in the next hour. What we would call the Regency period spanned around a quarter of a century from the very late 1790s to the early 1820s. It is linked with international political upheavals and followed on from the idealism of the Enlightenment and from the overwrought and decadent styles of the Baroque period. The monarchy had been overthrown in France and an interest in um, the principles of the old Roman republics led to a strong classical influence on material culture. Fashions imitated the drapery of Greek and Roman statues in an effort to channel some of this. The change from low-waisted structured styles for women and knee-length coats and vests for men to high-waisted, soft, drapey clothing for women and a shorter, tighter look for men began in the early 1790s before completely taking over as the norm by the end of that decade. Global economics and trade also played a part in how clothing changed as the introduction of light, airy fabrics and brightly printed goods encouraged styles that showed them off to great effect. The fabrics most commonly used in Ireland for clothing were wool, linen and silk. Dublin, Cork and Belfast were the main centres of the textile trade in the 1700s, but due to fierce competition from foreign goods and the removal of trade protections for local commerce, the textile industry as a whole had largely collapsed by the 1820s. We did in fact have a cotton industry here, but it was unfortunately short-lived. Dublin remained the focus of the poplin trade for a longer time, poplin being a silk wool mix which was very heavily associated with Ireland. Linen was used for the first and most private layer of clothing. For women, this was the shift or chemise, if you prefer the French name, and for men, the shirt. Being seen in these was akin to being seen naked. A person would have as many shifts or shirts as they could afford, as these were changed daily, just like our underwear is now. Linen is hard wearing and could take the indignities that boiling and scouring visited on the garments. Linen is also very comfortable fabric to wear beside the skin as it's cool and it wicks sweat away. The purpose of these garments were to keep valuable outer clothes separated from the bodies of the people wearing them. They also actually helped to keep the bodies themselves clean. The garments were made using very basic geometric shapes such as rectangles, squares and triangles and they were combined together um, to make the garment and they were cut this way in order to fit as many pieces as possible onto a single piece of fabric. Uh, the national linen industry was in robust health and it provided quality cloth to Ireland and its close British neighbours. Irish linen was so standard at the time that fabric is usually referred to in letters and other documents as simply Irish. Going from left to right there is a man's shirt um, with a high collar and without a frill at the front um, and he, this, this mannequin is wearing drawers and you can see that they lace closed at the knee. The next picture um, on towards the right is uh, the same type of shirt, just with a, a frill down the front, which just added a little bit of extra interest um, in between the opening of the waistcoat. And then there are two women's shifts, um, which as you can see are pretty basic. And they just have a, a sort of a squared neckline high at the back and low at the front and short sleeves. And the idea was that they would fit under um, sort of pretty much like this, the, the necklines of the day with the short sleeves. Many men wore drawers under their breeches, but it wasn't universal. Um, a man who didn't wear drawers would tuck the ends of his shirt between his legs. Uh, there was a little slit on the side, so you would just literally just tuck them under and put your, your trousers on. Drawers for women were rather new and they weren't commonly worn until the 1820s or so. Uh, they actually consisted of two separate pants legs which were attached at the waist and were open in between. 
Um, and great many decades pass before women's drawers become fully joined the whole way around. Uh, there was actually a bit of a uh, moral panic about women wearing any kind of clothing with legs. Um, anxieties about gender norms were very prevalent at the time and challenging, left, challenging them left somebody open to ridicule or attack. The next layer for women were stays. So the word corset also begins to be used during the Regency period for these foundations items. Stays supported the bust and smoothed the figure and depending on the style of the time they helped women to achieve a fashionable body shape. Contrary to popular opinion, um, corsets and stays were not actually evil instruments of torture. Um, most women, even in Victorian times, did not tight lace um, or feigned because of their corsets. The Regency style of stays in particular did very little to mould the body. They were softer and less structured than stays before them with very little boning, if any boning at all. And the length of them varied. So you could go from half stays, which would be sort of finishing just under the bust line, all the way down to just over the hip. And they were called long stays. Um, the classically inspired clothing styles um, hid the waist, as you can see, it's quite high meaning that emphasis on in dress at the time shifted to the bosom rather than to the waist. Um, this could of course be taken to extremes. One writer of the period felt it necessary to complain about, quote, the bosom shoved up to the chin, making a sort of fleshy shelf. Most women didn't expose too much skin, the favoured look being to actually lift and separate the breasts rather than push them completely up or compress them down. Uh, and this can easily be seen in fashion images published in the period. So I've just got a few images next of different types of stays. So again, from left going across to right, um, one, these are a pair that are called wrap stays and they have panels. So they have the front uh, of the garment and they have two panels extending off the back, which go around, cross over at the back and then are tied around the front. They're extremely soft. They're shaped at the bust with gussets, sort of triangular inserts just to give, um, you know, so that it's not a completely straight um, tube. Um, and these would be quite comfortable. Um, next along is a fashion plate, which has a chemise, it uh, says a coiffure on fichu, which is basically a scarf wrapped around um, the head, uh, a chemise and a corset. So you can see that the word corset was being used here too. The next along is um, a trade image of the lady's dressmaker where a dressmaker is um, fitting a lady for a garment and you can see she has um, stays on which open at the front and they have little tabs at the bottom and these are a holdover from earlier styles um, and they're sort of a mix between the more rigid styles of the past and the much softer styles uh, seen through the Regency period. And then again at the very right you can see this is a set of long stays which go all the way to the hip but again, there's shaping at the bust, a small amount of cording just underneath where the bust gussets are and then no other shaping whatsoever. Um, surprisingly, some men did corset. Um, this was not a common practice though. And men who did this were usually seen as dandies and fops, obsessed with their looks and figures to an unhealthy degree. And many satirical prints from the period, such as the one on the right hand side of the screen here, show dandies at their toilet, squeezing themselves into tight stays and padding out other parts of their figures um, to exaggerate the waistline. Um, on the left hand side of the screen is one more set of stays and this would be from the much later end of the period where it's heading into the Romantic era and you can see that there is much more structure to it. Um, there's a little bit of boning down the front and what you see uh, down the very, very front of the stays here is called the bosk. Now the bosk was a long um, wooden, it's a stick basically, um, and this was placed down the front of the stays, it's usually in a little pocket in the interior of the stays. And what this did was basically give you a flat front with no shaping and it, again you can see because of the wide gap it spread, it spread the chest out to the sides. Another garment reserved for women was the petticoat. Um, so the petticoat was particularly useful under the sheer white muslin gowns of the early Regency period. 
Uh, again, cottons and linens are the fabrics most often seen, and they can range from plain and simple to decorated with pin tucks and lace. Um, coloured slip petticoats really start to show up in the 1810s with the colour underneath sheer overgowns providing a really pleasing contrast and showing off a lot of details to great effect. They often came as skirts, high-waisted skirts with braces or straps uh, and often had an attached bodice as well which gave further smoothing and hiding of undergarments in the area above the waistline. As well as offering a little bit more opacity, petticoats gave long gown skirts a smoother, more un uninterrupted line, and in colder weather they could be made of flannel or wool and layered for warmth. You also realise when you wear them that they actually do an excellent job of um, keeping light gown fabrics from wrapping around your legs as you're walking. So they kind of hold, hold the skirts out away from your body a little bit. Women's gowns were the outermost layer aside from garments made for outdoors. The shape of gowns at the time was a high empire line bodice with long flowing skirts beneath it. In the early part of the Regency, there is volume and gathering all around the front and the back. However, as the years go by, the front quickly becomes flatter and smoother and the gathering becomes concentrated in a, in a, a narrow portion at the back. Nowadays, the seams of our sleeves are directly on the shoulder joint, but due to the historical shape of sleeves, where there is quite a large area which covers the shoulder blade, which I'm just going to show you on the mannequin. So usually it would stop here, but with the Regency period, you get an awful lot of this area being covered up with the sleeve. Um, due to the shape of that, there is um, the back panel of women's dresses, as you can see, is quite small and almost diamond shaped. So you have a... Gowns opened in the front or at the sides, secured either with a drawstring or a hidden closure pinned together under an apron style bib or a wrap around front. Back closing gowns come later in the period and can be secured with buttons or sometimes with lacing or ties. Necklines vary with fashion, as do sleeves which go from straight cut elbow length tubes early on to a lot more puffed and shaped as the period advances. Dress styles are simplest in the very early 1800s, gradually losing the simplicity in, flavor of flounced, in favor of flounced decorations, sawtooth edges and other applied trims. The shape of the skirt also changes, going from a large gathered rectangle to one with triangular panels inserted in order to reduce the bulk of fabric around the waist, but still keep all of the volume at the hem. The dress profile alters in appearance from being very straight up and down to more conical because of this. White dresses are like the, uh, the classic look for the Regency, uh, for reasons which I get into a little further on. Uh, decoration on them is usually a lot of white on white embroidery or effects woven into the textile such as a white uh, stripe or a self check. Colour is always present in Regency clothing but the little white dress is ubiquitous in the period. Uh, brightly printed cottons become more common uh, as the years go on and solid colours generally are seen in silk fabrics rather than anything else. So here again we just have a few garments to illustrate that. So going from the right hand side of the screen this time across to the left. So the right hand one would be the absolute turn of the century, the very very early 1800s and we can tell this because there's a very long train on the dress um, the train literally lasts a couple of years and it just it's dispensed with almost immediately. So generally speaking, we can identify any dress with a long train like that as being pretty much from between 1800 and 1805 and no later. The next dress along on the way to the left is um, a, a, a polka dotted um, cotton fabric. So you can see long sleeves. Um, there's a v-neck on it which crosses over at the front and a little flounce along the edges and on the cuffs. Uh, next uh, towards second left is um, would have been one of these muslin dresses um, and you can see that there's a, a, a bib shape across the front and that would drop forward 
and there would be a hidden closure underneath it then either um an overlapping layer or perhaps the two sides would be tied together underneath and then you you bring the bib forward and you secure it at the shoulder and this is um it is, will be white cotton with white embroidery on it and then the furthest one is the oldest dress and you can see that the puffed sleeves are starting to come in and that the skirt has a much more triangular shape than the ones that have been ahead of it uh, in the pictures. Now you had a multitude of what were called small clothes and other accessories which completed your wardrobe. Men and women both wore neckerchiefs which were properly called neck handkerchiefs and men required cravats and neck stocks then to close their shirt collars. Cravats would be lengths of fine white cloth tied around the neck and stocks were a shaped collar with a buckle at the back which could be removed for washing um, and with ruffled fabric stitched down on the top. Men, women and children also all wore stockings held up with garters at the knee. To prevent thicker leg hair showing through and ruining the appearance of their fine silk stockings, men resorted to wearing a second a cheaper pair of stockings underneath them. Uh, and of course, obviously such measures were never required for ladies. Um, so women filled the necklines of their daytime dresses then with a chemisette or a canazoo. And the main difference between these seemingly being that chemisettes were like little dickies worn under the dress bodice and the canazoo was the same kind of thing, but it was worn over the dress bodice. Both would be made of ultra fine cotton muslins and linen gauzes with a varying amount of frills or other detailing. Caps were de rigueur for married women and many single women past marrying age actually took to them quite readily. Uh, caps are wonderful at disguising untidy hair or increasing amounts of grey. Uh, these were all items where luxury and expense could be indulged because the amounts of fabric needed to make these are so much smaller than for a gown or a coat or any other garment. Pockets had been integrated in men's clothing for two centuries or more, but women wore their pockets on strings which were tied around the waist. As fashion for narrow skirts and classical drapery came in, um, the skirts before obviously would have been a much more bell shape. Uh, these hidden pockets turned into visible bags, often called reticules or ridicules. And it's generally assumed that this was the inception of the handbag um, and the tie on pockets became extinct around then. However, this is actually hotly contested um, as many garments throughout the first part of the 18th century and beyond actually still have skirt slits that you can reach through to access a tie on pocket. And so again, just a few uh, of, of the small clothing. So um, on the left, we have um, stockings. Stockings at the time weren't always white. They were often quite um, colored. So they could be a, a sort of lot of pastel colors and things like that. And um, I don't believe there was any connotation to the different colors. I know that crops up in other periods of time, um, but generally speaking, um, not as far as I know. Um, and if you can see, if you look at the heel, there is a seam so the stockings are actually pieced together rather than woven as one piece like our stockings would be now. Um, and oftentimes um, where the seam line and the heel is uh, by the ankle that would be decorated and it was called clocked stockings. Next over then you have a ribbon garter and that would usually be tied um, under the knee um, before where the calf um, increases and where that stricture is there and that means that the stockings don't slip down your leg and get all wrinkly. Directly underneath it is a stock and um, I just wanted to show that item. It's very very interesting and it's basically sort of like a, a, a prefabricated cravat and um, so people, men didn't have to fuss around with the different, the different ways to tie their cravat if they didn't want to. They would just place the stock on and it would buckle behind the neck. Uh, drawers, um, now I cheated slightly because these drawers are from the 1860s um, but I just wanted to give you a general idea of what they would have looked like at the time. There aren't that many that are actually kept and um, particularly from the Regency period just because they weren't that common um, by, by this time and they were still only sort of being, um, being started to be wearing by celebrities or fashionable ladies at the time. Um, so they were just quite long, quite baggy and as I said where the, um, where the, the front waist would be that, that whole seam was open. Um, left or right sorry of that is what a chemisette and as I said it's kind of like a little dicky it's not a full um, covering underneath it, it literally just sits under your clothing and it only um, fills in the bits that you wouldn't necessarily want seen during the daytime and um, 
majesty sort of increased during the day and then decreased as you went into into the, the evening and um, and a lot of the times you get a lot of versatility with these because you can pop them under any dress and it doesn't matter then you can sort of um mix and match your items and make a little bit more of a versatile wardrobe and just underneath that then is a cap um and these are can be quite frilly and lacy um and sometimes quite simple um but as i said they were sort of a, an area where you could show off the type of fabrics that you could afford so they tend to be quite um some of them can be quite over the top basically this is nightwear then as well uh, the final thing so there's a man's nightshirt on the left and then two women's dressing gowns are or, or um, pain wires and these would be worn and um, literally in and around the bed chamber and possibly very early in the morning when you were breakfasting so for outdoor clothing and um, men had little choice here a great coat would have multiple capes across the shoulder and this was the usual type uh, women had more variety so they could wear short bolero like spencer jackets or full length dress coats called pelisses a riding goat, which is a corruption of the name riding coat, was similar to this, but it had very strong military influences. These could be made of different weight fabrics, depending on the season or depending on whether you're in town or at home in the country. Obviously, you would wear your nicer clothes in town. Mantles were a holdover from previous decades. They were worn early in the period or during a clement weather. They look more or less like a cape, sometimes with a an oversized hood and with longer front panels than the back was. Uh, women often also wore their own version of a great coat tailored for themselves but again with the, 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 the capes, the multiple capes on the shoulder. Now the custom at the time was for people to change clothes multiple times as the day wore on. The higher status or the richer you were then the more clothing you owned and the more frequently you would have changed it. People at the low end of the income scale would have had very few items of clothing and therefore they wouldn't have changed really throughout the day at all. If you were middle to upper class, however, there were a number of social rules relating to what type of clothing was worn and when. And for women in particular, these rules would have been observed pretty closely. The first part of the day dictated morning, not morning dress, which was also called undress. And despite how it sounds undress, Undress was not actually a state of being undressed. It might be easier to think of it as being underdressed. Uh, this would be informal outfits that would be appropriate to breakfast in, write your letters, read, or sort of carry out any other uh, domestic activities. Uh, long sleeves and modest necklines were usual, and it was permissible to be visited in your own house while wearing a, mo a morning dress, but you would never go out of doors in that kind of outfit. Uh, calling on or visiting friends and acquaintances was one of the great social customs of the time. Social networks were held together, I beg your pardon, uh, by numerous acts of mutual politeness and obligation, all regulated by well-known behaviours. Calling was usually done in the morning and people would wait in when they knew a call was due. Going out showed an insulting disregard for the visitor, which was only trumped in rudeness by pretending you were not at home at all and instructing your servants to turn the visitor away. If a call was unexpected and the visitee was truly not home, a caller might leave a card with the servants to indicate their presence and the call then would be duly repaid in time. Ladies visited each other all the time, but a woman would never call on a man. Um, in fact, Jane Austen, um, for her publisher, she had to actually write and ask him to come and visit her when they wanted to discuss business and um, because it was completely inappropriate for her to physically go and visit him. Visits were generally short, but not too short. 15, 20 minutes thereabouts was considered just right, but neither did you want to overstay your welcome. Most visits were for pleasure, but visits of duty to relatives or peers in disadvantaged, disadvantaged circumstances were just as important. Calls should be repaid promptly. Taking too long to return a call was felt to be an insult. From Early afternoon onwards, um, day dress or half dress was required. It was more formal than undress and the clothing worn in this part of the day often reflected the activities that were being undertaken by the lady wearing them, such as walking for exercise, promenading, visiting friends and neighbours. As such, they were more likely to be seen and generally were more observant of trends than dresses for the home. Clothes for walking specifically often would have had hem lengths to suit. 
that beautiful drapey muslin dress sweeping across the floor at home isn't going to survive a brisk walk around the local countryside. Varying length dresses feature in fashion prints for outdoor outfits, uh, along with other weather appropriate items such as your Spencer jackets, your pelisses, hats and bonnets, umbrellas, parasols, muffs, tippets and shawls. Evening wear covered a set of social engagements. I'm just going to move the slides on there just to show some examples. Um, which included dinners, parties, assemblies and balls. So there was a spectrum of formality here, depending on whether you were attending these engagements in your locality or in town. Dinner would be the least formal of these um, and in which long sleeves were, were perfectly permitted. Um, full dress would be like the modern black tie equivalent of the Regency period and was most often see, seen at high society balls in large cities. The shoulders and décolletage were bared and short sleeves were acceptable, but arms were generally covered uh, up to or over the elbow with gloves. Men should wear breeches with fine stockings and formal slippers. Trousers or pantaloons were much too casual to be worn until later on in the Regency and boots were absolutely forbidden because boot, like boots are outdoor clothing and it's one of the things that crops up quite frequently in movies where male characters are indoors all the time in their boots and this wouldn't have happened. They would have changed their shoes into a more suitable um, indoor style. So just uh, to go to the pictures, um, from the left we have morning dress and you can see it's generally a bit more simple, usually white, kind of negligee type of style, um, very high neck and long sleeves. Uh, the next one in the middle would be your um, afternoon dress and this would be a lady out walking. So you can see that um, she has a little Spencer jacket on with a nice little frill around the top and uh, a hat on the front. And you can see between her Spencer and her face, that's a chemisette, that frill around the neck is her chemisette. And the, the final one is um, evening dress and you can see it's much more elaborate. It's got short sleeves um, and it's got, a, 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 it's, I wouldn't quite call it a train, but it's definitely a much longer length um, than the other dresses would be. Um, so dancing, of course, was often the main focus of balls and assemblies and frequently occurred at private parties as well. A strict set of rules governed social interactions and care had to be taken not to cause offence or scandal. A man must be introduced to a lady before he could converse or dance with her. Introductions would be carried out by mutual acquaintances or if none were present, a master of ceremonies would do this at a public ball. A lady could never ask a gentleman to dance. Couples danced for two dances before changing partners and it was considered to be good manners to dance with multiple people. Again, it's this um, reliance on social interactions, basically. It's just uh, enhancing social interactions with other people. Um, Over-reliance on one partner would often lead to accusations of partiality. At the end of the two dances, a gentleman should escort his partner back to her friends or relatives, or if dinner was about to begin, they would go into the supper room. If a lady refused a dance with a gentleman, it was then impolite to dance with another. So you kind of had to be prepared to dance with unpleasant partners occasionally if you wanted to avoid sitting down all night. Now, certain occasions or changes in life called for extremely specific clothing. Court dress, as the name suggests, was worn to court, both in Ireland and Britain at the time. The Irish court was centred around Dublin Castle and the, unsurprisingly, the British court would be centred around London and the various palaces there. Uh, dress codes were extremely proscriptive and rigid and often had not been updated for many years, so they reflected much older styles of clothing. But of course, the people visiting court were doing their best to look elegant and al as a la mode as they possibly could. And this all came together in this beautiful mess here on the left hand side, um, which is early 1800s female court dress. So the rules at the time would have stated, and this was harking back to the 1770s or the 1780s, that hoops and panniers must be worn. Um, but of course, the style at the time was for these beautiful classic looking dresses, and this pretty much was the result. So you had these impossibly high hoops um, underneath your beautiful Grecian style dress. Um, it looks completely ridiculous, and you kind of wonder how it ever sort of stayed as a trend. Um, but Queen Caroline, um, was not to be swayed and basically until she died the hoops were part of court dress. Um, personally I kind of love how stupid it looks. <laughs> um, it's just very very over the top 
Um, the next one then, the next picture on the right is a man's court dress and this is from the 1830s and this looks almost identical to um, the style of men's clothing that would have been worn again in the, in the late 1700s, the 1770s and the 1780s. Um, it's a very, very particular style, very identifiable. And you can see that um, even though fashions obviously were moving on in real life, they just, they were like frozen in time basically in, in court. Morning dress at this point in time was not as highly codified as it eventually became in the Victorian period, but it did exist. Again, this is always going to be most accessible to those people who had money to buy new clothing. Many families didn't and people would have to make do with strategies such as dyeing older garments black um, or covering bonnets um, with new fabric and removing um, inappropriate trims. As with pockets, there's an assumption that any black regions of clothing in museums would be associated with mourning. But unfortunately, black is also a colour that was fashionable at different times and sometimes it can be quite hard to tell the difference. Um, Men's clothing also, uh, often featured black uh, in their jackets and their pants, and so mourning would often be less of a financial outlay for them. Those least able to spend money on specific clothing would have demonstrated their state of bereavement with black touches such as armbands, neck scarves, um, or other accessories. Uh, the main features of mourning garb were that the fabrics should be dull, they should not be shiny, so that would mean things like satins and lustrings were out. Um, and this is where, um, again, in Victorian times, you get this heavy reliance on crepe. It's a very matte type of fabric. Um, and generally speaking, a lack of frivolity, um, which would be minimally decorated. Now, mourning was a very frequent custom, as one was expected to mourn for extended family members and important figures, such as royalty. The length of mourning depended on your closeness to the deceased. Women often carried the social burden of mourning for a lot longer than men did, such as when a spouse died. Women should go into deep mourning and dress and act accordingly for over a year, whereas men obviously had business to attend to uh, and they were not held to the same standard of, um, of isolation uh, as women. A man could also marry very soon after a death, especially if he was left with children to take care of. On the other hand, it would have been extremely shocking for a woman to act and remarry so quickly. As one emerged from full mourning into half mourning, uh, suitably sombre colours such as purples or greys could be added to your wardrobe then. So in the pictures here, um, it's obviously a very atmospheric picture on the left. You've kind of got a very funerary looking urn um, and the lady dressed um, almost entirely in black with a veil over her. There are some white touches here, um, but not many. And there is very minimal decoration. Um, the right hand picture then would be half morning. So this would be like a walking outfit or an afternoon outfit for half morning. So you can see that like these are still quite fashionable um, garments, particularly for upper class uh, women and men. Um, you, you were still following trends. You just maybe weren't being as flamboyant about the decoration on your garments. Um, but this lady has managed to get away with a good bit. And you can see there's a mixture of black and white um, in, in, in her clothing. Now, both men and women could own specific clothing for hunting and riding. Um, a man's garments varied in this regard from his everyday wear, not so much in style, uh, but in the colours and the fabrics were chosen to stand up to rough use. The, the cut of the coat front was sloped away um, so as not to get um, all bunched up, basically, when you're sitting astride a horse. Women of means sometimes had an outfit made specifically for horse riding called a riding habit. The jacket was tight fitting, as you can see in the picture here on the right, and made along masculine lines and it often had a military look to it, which you can see here with the buttons across the front. And there was a long skirt then in matching wool, which completed the outfit. Now, clothing was a strong indicator of class and rank, both hugely important factors at the time. This applied to all behaviour, including how undressed and accessories look respectable and well turned out, whereas lower class people um, shouldn't seek to get above themselves by wearing anything too fine. Um, at this point, obviously, um, in time, we have, I suppose, that sort of um, idea that God had put you in the place in society in which you were, and therefore you shouldn't tr uh, try to sort of cross too many social um, boundaries um, because it was not how the way things were meant to be. Dressing appropriately to one station was considered the normal and natural state of things, and anything outside of that was seen as a transgression. Clothes carry meaning, and they could be read in Ellen's time as much as we read other people's clothing today. 
one should not stand out too much in terms of eccentricity, but neither should a person be completely neglectful of their appearance. The highest compliment a lady could expect was to be called elegant. Paying attention to current fashion was a good thing, but you didn't want to be too much of a clothes horse as this showed a lack of taste and taste was the most important factor here. There was a huge degree of classism rooted in how other people perceived uh, and how people perceived others based on their appearances. A good taste implied good breeding and good social credentials. Uh, being a man or woman who followed fashion too closely was, ta was thought to sorry was thought to betray a degree of vulgarity, uh, and this was very much associated with the type of person who may have had money but certainly not taste or any of the other attributes that taste was believed to indicate. This line of thought continues on to the Victorian period when guides to manners and etiquette were widely published for a fast growing population of nouveau riche blow-ins who couldn't possibly have the refined manners that a titled background obviously gives. The next few slides are of satirical prints which mocked fashion followers of the day. Um, so here you can see um, so most took new trends the the most um characters took new trends and then greatly exaggerated them so they mimicked the extremes that fashion victims were thought to take them to so this first one here is actually an irish print from 1808 but it's copied from a london print of the time uh, and you can see it's not particularly impressed with the transparency of the um the new favorite cotton muslins because you can obviously see the entire of the lady's body uh, at the time which was considered quite scandalous and it was considered very french as well which was a bad thing the year 1740 um it says a lady's full dress of bombazine which was a type of fabric and then it says the year 1808, ladies undress of Bumby scene. Um, the next one um, <laughs> is called Les In Invisables, so the Invisibles. Um, and this is poking poking fun at the haha -ha, poke bonnet. Um, so this is a, a type of style that would have come out again in the very early 1800s. And it was kind of a, a long, obviously not as long as that in real life. Um, but again, these these cartoon artists uh, took it all to extreme, um, and you can see here the, uh, the poking fun at the at the general shape of them. Um, so um, and again, the last one here um, is uh, it's called Parisian ladies in their winter dress for eighteen hundred, um, and this is more or less uh, not appreciating. <laughs> the sexy new French fashions for clothing. Um, and pretty much like the first Irish print, you can see that um, it's just, uh, you can basically see everything. Um, and the ironing of it being, uh, the irony of it being that it, it's, it's called full dress, i.e. evening dress, but being a play on undress. Um, and the last one then would be um, a dandy. So um, some men wore their clothes a little bit too tightly. Um, and so this gentleman, uh, this was actually based on a letter that was written into a newspaper about somebody who had seen a dandy who, because his pants and his uh, his jacket were so tight, he dropped his hand neck or his neckerchief and, um, and couldn't pick it up and apparently did a bit of a, a dance in the street trying to figure out how best to retrieve it from the floor. Now, um, Ellen Hutchins and her family occupied a place in elite society. So they weren't what one would call super rich, but they were modestly well to do. And materially speaking, they would definitely have been better off than the ordinary population of Bantry at the time. They would have enjoyed uh, connections with um, lo other local um, families and landowners, and they enjoyed a position of respectability as one of the more um, important families in the area. Uh, for families in polite society, um, what all of this meant was keeping up with changing fashions, in terms of style and fabric. So it wasn't always easy, especially for respectable families like Ellen's, whose income and circumstances wouldn't always have allowed this. An individual's wardrobe contents were closely related to their um, status and their income. Uh, for example, in the writings of Jane Austen, Emma Woodhouse is phenomenally rich with an inheritance of 30,000 pounds, which uh, is estimated as approximately 2 million sterling in today's terms. So it wouldn't be unexpected for Miss Woodhouse to have a comprehensive wardrobe covering covering multiple seasons um, and occasions. Um, if any of you have seen the newest film adaptation by Autumn de Wilde, this was released earlier this year, it shows Emma with numerous mu uh, white muslin dresses, coloured underdresses, evening gowns, chemisettes, jackets, hats, coats, 
uh, to suit all manner of occasions. And this wouldn't have been out of character for a young fashion conscious woman with that much money, um, even in a small enough town like Highbury. Um, until the Industrial Revolution changed everything, manufactured goods were appallingly expensive and labour was not. So this is complete contrast to today when we can buy a whole outfit for less than 50 euro, but having a cleaner for a couple of times a week is considered a peak Celtic tiger affluence. Um, in any given item of clothing, the fabric uh, at, in the Regency period was likely to be the most costly part and it often dwarfed the wages um, or the charges that the actual dressmakers um, charged for them. Bills and invoices attest to how small the seamstress's wages were in comparison to the cost of the fabric. The best way I can describe it would be if the only clothes you could ever wear were designer clothes. It's, you're talking that level of cost. Um, and so uh, because of that, people generally didn't have very varied wardrobes unless they were um, astronomically rich. Um, you would have had an awful lot of basic items and then um, mixed and matched accessories and things like that to give yourself a little bit more variety. A major perk of being in service to a well-off family would have been gifts of clothing or fabric given by employers to their servants. And there was a whole industry based around the secondhand clothing market, um, with even streets in London such as Petticoat Lane being called after all the, the secondhand clothes that were um, sold there. The scraps left over from making clothes were called cabbage and they could actually be pieced into linings or small items like pockets uh, or used for a patchwork. Um, old gowns could be made over as petticoats or used for trimmings when they began to look aged and anything that was considered totally past it would be cut to shreds and you could use that as stuffing in cushions or pin cushions or anything like that. Garments were worn, lent out, altered, mended, remade, passed down, worn out and repurposed until eventually the rags made it to the paper industry where they began another new life. Another new life. So clothing was made to be as adaptable as possible, um, such as um, a gown with detachable long sleeves. So they could be worn during the day, the long sleeves could, but then you could remove them if you were attending a dinner or another evening event. Uh, the constant changing of small details was carried out to keep the whole outfit up to date, uh, retrimming dresses and bonnets um, and recovering them to match the demands of the current modes. And numerous examples exist of dresses made in the mid 18 uh, made in the mid 1800s, so kind of the 1830s, 40s, 50s, which were made out of fabric that was um, almost 100 years old at that stage, which had been seen as valuable enough to be stored carefully, and then they were taken out of storage and remade. Um, the decorative motifs woven into the fabric at the time in those silks. Um, were similar to those that were in fashion in sort of the 1840s um, and the old styles of the uh, mid to late 1700s used enough fabric in them to allow for um, again in the 1840s the, the voluminous um, sleeves and the bell-shaped skirts. Um, there are by contrast very few examples of maternity wear in museums or private collections uh, because most people even if they were reasonably well off just simply could not afford a whole other wardrobe for uh, what was obviously a large part of a woman's life but such a small period of time and um, compared to um, the decades that a lot of people would keep their clothes for and um, most people would make um, alterations to existing garments to help deal with the physical changes. Um, so certain garment types then were also much more wearable during pregnancy, such as on the left here, this picture is called a short gown. And it's literally, it's almost like a dress just with a very, very short, um, a short skirt on it. Um, and these would be worn with um, a, a separate petticoat, so a high-waisted skirt. And you can see that obviously there is, there's plenty of um, fabric and there's plenty of um, leeway there for, for, for pregnancy um, if you were wearing this particular type of outfit. And the one on the right is quite interesting. Um, so um, it has evidence so again, I, I don't know if you remember, I said earlier that sort of by the middle of the Regency, the fullness of the skirt had sort of concentrated in this area at the back. Well, this particular, um, this red silk outfit, it appears that the skirt was um, removed from the waistband and actually turned around so that all of the volume in the fabric was at the front. Um, and this, that basically indicates that it was, it was altered for maternity. Now, home sewing was widely practiced throughout Ireland and Europe, being a particularly feminine skill. And this is not to say that many men couldn't sew, 
uh, sailors in particular were well used to repairing or even making from scratch their seagoing clothes. But it wasn't expected of men in, uh, as a whole in the same way that it was for women. Sewing gave women something useful to do, both rich and poor. Uh, basic items such as linen undergarments were commonly made by women at home. Um, and even more so if money was tight or in working class families. Uh, this tradition actually persists throughout history though, because one notable example was Catherine of Aragon, who even after Henry VIII had dissolved their marriage, she insisted on making the king's undershirts because she saw it as her wifely duty. Um, if, if there were servants or a housekeeper in your house, the more boring parts, so let's say like putting together the long seams, uh, those bits might have been passed to um, your servants as a task to do and then the ladies of the house could finish off um, the sort of more complicated areas um, and the large quantities of linen would be bought and the shirts would be made up in bulk to save money and again this is where the geometric shapes come in there are very um, uh, clever cutting diagrams through the period where basically it shows you the best layout of all your pieces to get the absolute most um, out of your fabric and to cause the least wastage. Um, it was also considered one's responsibility to make basic items for poor families in the parish, regardless of how constrained your income might be. Um, accessories then, such as day caps, uh, as I said earlier, and chemisettes were perfect for making at home um, because they were relatively simple arrangements uh, of basic shapes and they involved quite light handwork. So one could make these up quite quickly and with very little in the way of necessaries. And they were a really easy and economical way to update your wardrobe and to make it look a bit more current. Now, professional services were widely available to those who wanted them. A person's good clothes were more likely to have been made by a tradesperson than not, um, because it wouldn't be worth what, running the risk of wasting your costly fabric with injudicious cutting or with poor fitting. In Austen's novel, Emma, even Harriet Smith, Miss Woodhouse's friend from a lower social class, she had an allowance from her, her anonymous father that enabled her to pay somebody in the village to make her clothes. Uh, there wasn't always the same divide in skill either between home sewing and professional sewing that we see today. Um, many ladies were extremely skilled work, work women and they could make a great many items themselves and um, they just didn't necessarily always want to. Uh, the difference was usually in the amount of, amount of experience that someone had in fitting clothing to individual bodies. Uh, and speaking from my own efforts in making reproductions, uh, getting the fit right is definitely a pretty difficult thing to achieve. So fittings would take place in the client's home and frequently there would be forward and back travel of the new item as further alterations were needed upon completion. Making clothing was actually a kind of piecework. Um, so making the garment, lining the garment, trimming it were all billed as separate things on the invoice and they were also billed separately to the fabric or anything else that was used such as buttons or thread. Uh, dressmakers or mantua makers as they might also have been called they worked by draping directly onto the client's body or um, taking a pattern from an existing garment. So if you had an extremely old garment, you could pick it apart and use that as a template basically for your new garment or um, dressmakers could take a template from an existing garment that uh, you wore quite frequently. Um, if the draped pattern was made of cloth rather than paper, then that cloth would often be used as the lining on the inside of the finished piece in order to save wasting it. Uh, tailors, by contrast, uh, would have taken body measurements from their clients and they used trade knowledge then to draft a pattern um, on the cloth uh, before cutting it, uh, putting it together and then making adjustments when it was made up. Um, unlike most women's clothing, and um, because they were modeled directly on male garments, uh, the riding habits that, as I said, women would have worn when they were out um, hunting, uh, would have, they were specifically made by tailors um, because there were very specific techniques that tailors used that dressmakers didn't. So ready to wear or off the rack clothing wasn't unheard of, but largely unless they had limited choice, people's clothes were made specially to fit them. Uh, men's clothing was easier to provide ready to wear, uh, particularly shirts and other less tailored garments. Uh, there is an increase in ready-made women's clothing during the period but again much of this trade might have been in sort of more loose fitting items like cloaks um, and dressmakers uh, would often also sell um, if they had a commission that fell through and then they would sell that dress on ready-made. 
to another client. Um, so the pictures in here, we have um, Atelier des Modistes on the left, uh, which is basically the, the, the fashion maker's atelier. And so this looks more like a millinery um, warehouse where people would, it would have been hats and other sort of fancy trimmings and small items like chemisettes and things would have been made by a milliner. Um, the phrase changed over time and it now means only somebody who makes hats. But back in the period, these um, women would have made a lot of other smaller items that are not just hats. Um, and so you can see the women here kind of looking at uh, stock, trying things on, looking at trimmings um, and deciding uh, how they wanted their hats and, uh, and small items to look. And then on the right hand side, um, this is a linen drapers in Bond Street in London. Um, now this is massive. Basically you've got um, like three or four rooms uh, deep. Um, it would be more or less like a showroom and um, you would have waited there to be served by one of the storekeepers uh, who would have pulled out the fabric that you pointed out and then you would have bought it, um, bought it off the bolt. The fabric at the time was woven on a much narrower loom than modern fabrics who were used these days. Anybody who makes clothing would be used to buying sort of 45 to 60 inch um, fabric whereas it could have been as narrow as sort of mid 20s or um, mid 30s uh, inches of fabric. So again, just to increase the cost as well as the fabric being expensive, you unfortunately needed an awful lot more to buy more of it to make up a gown um, or a coat than you would uh, if you were doing the same thing today. So um, tailors, dressmakers and milliners would have provided some garment making services, whereas drapers and mercers then provided the cloth for that. And again, until department stores um, and things come in, these are two totally separate businesses. Um, on Patrick Street in 1810, there were six haberdashers, um, which would have sold trimmings and ribbons and all the little nice things to sort of uh, uh, um, add on to your clothing. Um, as two milliners, four ladies shoemakers and then situated on other streets in the very very center of the city would have been these and countless more trades so along with wool cotton and linen sellers and a silk mercer uh, they were glovers hosiers boot makers tailors breeches makers hatters there was a shirt warehouse and a trimming warehouse um, there was no lack of places to buy essential items or find the requisites for retrimming or refashioning older clothing or hats. Uh, Dublin would have housed a vigorous ribbon industry and these goods were commonly used uh, to liven up an outfit. And uh, there were also several clothiers or clothesmen, um, which I believe might have been secondhand um, clothing sellers as well, running businesses in the city. Um, in Bantry, um, as with a lot of other small towns, um, there usually um, there might have been a local shop that had some of these kind of goods, um, but a lot of the time you would have um, gone to Cork specifically for a shopping trip or you would be relying on friends who go to Cork to bring back things for you. So the names on the trade directories of the time then also show us the gender divide present in these trades. So women, as you can see from the pictures, typically populate uh, the millinery and the haberdashery businesses because these were seen as very appropriate employment for ladies. Uh, men then would dominate the other trades as was usual at the time and women also form more or less the entire workforce for the laundering trade. So given how expensive your single garment could be, having it cleaned to a high standard was immensely important to ensure that it lasted as long as possible. In very small or financially constrained households, there is a greater possibility of the mistress or any other ladies in the house and um, basically having to muck in um, to get the washing done alongside maid or a maid or maids. Um, but realistically, the, 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 it's sheer toil involved um, in hauling wood, hauling water and then scrubbing and wringing um, all, of the, all of the items that needed to be washed um, and the sheer amount of undergarments and bed linens, napiery, hosiery um, and clothing that would accrue over a week or, or a couple of weeks and meant that um, there were professional laundry women and if people could afford to send it out or wanted to send it out, they would do that. Um, many antique undergarments are marked um, for identification and um, to uh, make sure that they didn't get mixed up with other people's um, and they were also um, accounted for on the laundresses invoice um, to help prevent loss of what was valuable clothing and you do hear stories of um, things going missing or getting mixed up with other people's clothing or oftentimes being stolen um, from, from the laundresses um, property. Um, it could take more than two days 
to first spot clean and then wash, dry and iron everything in a household. So washing costs were actually a massive proportion of a person's income and a lot more than we would give it credit for. So these are all adverts from Cork Papers. Um, and you can see that there's um, M. White on Patrick Street, um, who's returned from London with this beautiful supply of all her fancy goods. Um, Bergen um, on Grand Parade, and there's a, I, I can send these on, or we can make a document of this at the end if anyone wants to look at them. Um, like muffs, tippets, fur, straw and, chip, straw and chip hats, flowers, feathers, fringes, all of these kind of things would be sold by them. And in Nixon's then as well, they did wholesale and retail linen. And you can see their muslins, calicos, linen, sheetings, diapers, dimity, all of these different types of fabric would be sold. And there's a couple more there as well, with just a little map of um, what work looked like at the time. Um, and um, then a trade card, which was slightly different from advertisement. It was a little bit more like a business card type idea where you had a little image on it. Um, and then um, this is for linen drapers um, and, and gives where they are. Generally speaking, the adverts go into more detail about what's actually um, on sale in the shop. Um, so increased mechanization of the textile industries had a small role in shaping changes too are shaping trends. Um, after the netting machine was invented in 1808, you see tool dress is becoming quite popular, these mesh dresses. And before this, the net would have to have been made entirely by hand, and it consequently it was expensive and um, not too common. So it also made lace a more attainable luxury because obviously lace um, is based, it's, it's a, the base fabric of it is this net, and once that comes down, you're still paying for the labor to embroider it, but um, it makes it slightly more achievable for more people. Um, however, the biggest changes in the cost and availability of goods came as a result of, um, unfortunately, slavery and colonialism. And I think it's extremely important to remember that there was actually a real human cost to the very privileged lives that a lot of these uh, Regency upper classes people led. Um, families may not all have directly gained from the practice of owning large plantations or owning enslaved people, but most of society at the time would have indirectly benefited from those activities, um, having more choices and, and reduced costs. Um, all of the raw material used in British and Irish made cotton fabrics would have been imported from the West Indies and British expansion uh, overseas into India led to a multitude of really exciting new goods in large cities and towns. Uh, the sheer muslins, which were loved um, by the bright young things of the Regency, uh, the paisley shawls, um, and in these pictures here you can see the, the middle picture is a lady who's made um, a dress out of some paisley shawls and has one draped around her. Um, the boldly printed um, handkerchiefs, uh, such as the one on the right, waistcoats and gowns, and on the left um, is a dress which would have been made up in the 1810s from chintz fabric, which would have been quite um, popular at the turn of the century and would have come from India. Um, these were all made accessible through conquest. Um, the much lower cost of these goods also caused um, crises in local industries because they resulted in um, high customs charges. Um, and eventually um, in outright bans and legislation on foreign goods, but it never really lasted that long. And um, particularly in Ireland, it didn't have um, the kind of um, enhancing effect on local industries as it should have, as should have had. Um, in the 1700s, Europe was flooded with high quality fabrics from places like India and China. Um, and these quickly made their way into the Irish market and along with increased um, British production, which was um, a direct response to the same influx in their own country. And um, this eventually collapsed um, a lot of the home textile industries. Um, small Irish manufacturers just could not compete with the volume of exports from Britain. Um, and they were unable to invest heavily in a lot of the new machinery that was coming along, which would have allowed them to keep up with, with um, external production. Um, so that more or less, um, on that sombre note, um, kind of wraps up um, the, the the basic talk and um, I hope it's given people a good overview um, of the Regency period, some customs relating to clothing or, or um, social manners um, and how the clothing overall looked. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you to everybody for um, listening and I really hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much Kerry, that was absolutely lovely um, and you have bravely agreed to take questions as well, yes. haven't you? Yes, <laughs> yes I <have. laughs> So I think 
in, I think it's recognition of how full your talk was, that actually we've only got a couple come through. <laughs> so uh, I think that says something in itself, don't you? Um, and one of them, one of them actually is more for me than for you, because it's about Ellen. But I'll, I'll take your one. Actually, I'll take that one first, give you a breather. Um, um, a question we've been asked is, would Ellen or someone in her household ever have made her clothes? Or would they generally be made by a dressmaker, either local or further afield? Um, it's actually quite difficult to answer that for Ellen's own clothes. Um, I've read all the letters she's written to her brothers and to the botanists looking for any information about clothes. And there's actually nothing really about what she's wearing. But interestingly, her little brother, Sam, when he goes to Trinity College Dublin, he writes home, he clearly in a letter we haven't got, he's written home asking to have some shirts made. She says, yes, certainly we can organize that, but we'll need to know more, please. We need to know what size you are, and I want to know what quality of linen you want. So there's a nice little mention of it. And on the edge of one of the letters, he's written a little list. Uh, presu we presume it must be what he thinks he needs for going to college in Dublin. Um, and it's nightcaps, shirts. There's a little list of the things of clothes that he thinks he'll need. So yes, they're clearly being made from the house at Balaliki, whether they're in the house, by housekeeper or Ellen herself, or whether they're, or her mother possibly, though I don't think she was well enough to do so at that stage, um, or whether they are simply commissioning somebody local to do it. But he's choosing, when he's in Dublin, he's choosing to ask family in Balaliki to make his shirts or organize his shirts. So I think that says us something. The other question is for you, Carrie. Okay. Um, just pop it up. Um, you, you came close, I think, on what you've already said. But when dressmakers make garments using a pattern from an existing dress, did they have to unpick the existing dress or would they know how to make it without unpicking it? So, um, no, um, if it was an extremely old garment and people were going to be doing something with it anyway that involved unpicking it, then they could take it apart. So this would be possibly if it was being dyed a different color or remade into another type of garment, they would unpick it. Um, and then take the pattern from those pieces. Um, but no, dressmakers would have been able to have a garment brought to them um, and just to um, take the pattern from that. Um, a lot of it is um, as a result that um, the shapes are, most of the garments, um, let's say women's dresses, run on roughly the same lines. You're going to have a collaboration between the, the person commissioning this uh, and the dressmaker in terms of what they like the best and how they want it to look um, but there's a good deal of trust there um, but you could um, and I, I have done it myself and I know other, other people who make costumes have that if you've made something that you really really like a lot of the times it's just a matter of um, laying the garment out flat and basically tracing over the lines um, either with um, paper or with cloth and you just mark the, the seam lines and then pretty much as a lot of patterns are made now, you just leave an allowance around the, the side um, of the edges so that you have um, the extra fabric to make the seams of the garment. Um, and it's a similar, um, kind of, um, a similar kind of way that if um, people study extant as in historical garments in museums, obviously um, there's very little touching can be done, but you can still take a pattern from them in more or less the same way where you can map out the, the seam lines and things like that. So um, no, you, you didn't have to destroy the garment um, all, all the time to do it. Great, thanks Kerry, thank you. Um, there's a lovely comment here and someone loved the recycling element at the times from the dress to paper. And I agree, that was a lovely bit. <laughs> um, another, another question. Um, someone was intrigued to see the word diaper in one of the adverts. Um, so has the meaning of the word changed since then? Yes, um, an awful lot of clothing terms from um, several hundred years ago have completely changed in meaning. Um, and diaper would have been um, a particular texture. Um, so a, a lot of the time, my understanding of it um, in an amateur sense would be that the words are associated with the texture and then they eventually become much narrower in their use and they become associated with a specific item rather than with something that's made from that cloth if you get me um so you could have let's say for instance um 
uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head of an example, um, but a lot of the time you have a, a type of fabric um, that, as I said, becomes much more narrowed in its usage and is referred then to um, after a period of time, um, it, it becomes uh, something to refer to a specific item. Um, so let's say, for instance, um, the word scarlet in Tudor times actually referred to a type of cloth that was roughly a scarlet colour. Um, and you see the, nar the usage of it eventually being narrowed. Um, so like there is no scarlet cloth anymore and like that there wouldn't exactly be a diaper cloth anymore, but they're kind of vestiges of, um, of old usages of them. Thanks. I hope that answers the question for, for the person <laughs> there. Thank you, that's lovely. Um, another, another, another one in. Um, you mentioned that a lot of the materials were relatively soft, but there is still a huge number of layers relative to what we wear today. What evidence or anecdotes do we have that indicate people felt constricted? Um, there, there are some. Um, a lot of this would be pretty much like the Madeline's research with Ellen. You're relying on documents such as letters where people's feelings are discussed. Um, I know one particular um, example off the top of my head would be um, Georgiana, the Duchess of Devonshire, um, where she comments in, um, I believe, one of her letters about how um, the new style of stays, which are sort of the precursor to a corset that she's wearing. And these would have been um, sort of conical shaped um, with a, a front that went up um, to two points around the shoulder point. And she remarks on how, how, how much they're sticking in because part of the, the shape of them, it actually aids the posture, it moves the shoulders back. But apparently this particular style, this new style, cut in under her arm so much, she just, she gave out reams about it in a lecture anyway. <laughs> so that's, that's the kind of thing that you're relying on as such. Um, I suppose it's, it's like anything nowadays um, in fashion magazines, nobody really documents what wearing the clothes feels like. They're more about how, how the clothes look. Um, and it's only when you get people's own personal, um, their own personal um, accounts and their own personal um details of their inner lives and things like that, that, that you would see um, places like that. Um, from, if I can offer my own perspective, um, the, it, it is um, less constricting than the styles that would have come before ish to wear um, and than the styles afterwards because the, the shape ends under the bust. So there's a whole lot of, um, there's a whole lot of loose clothing around the waist um, and down the legs and so in and of itself just the fact that only the top part of your body was being shaped um, would indicate that um, you know that people may have felt less constricted in these than um, in others. We can see it evidentially as well just in the makeup of, of let's say the stays from the previous period the amount of stiffening that would have been used in those compared to the stiffening that might have been used um, in the, or the lack of stiffening that we can sometimes see in historical garments um, that are left over from the Regency period. Great. Thank you very much for that, Carrie. Now, there's another question that's going to require you to do a little bit of move away and get, I think. Okay. Which is, have you got, and in which, and I will, I'll take over screen and show you the, show the Jenny Dempsey material I wanted to, while you do that, if that's all right. Um, the question is, have you got your Ellen costume there, which I can see you have behind you, um, the one you've used when, when, when you've been Ellen. Could you show us a few of the details on that? And have you got the shoes? Um, I don't, I'm, <laughs> I have the dress, um, obviously. So. Yeah. so shall I just, if I, are you okay to do that right now? Or would you like a moment to set it up and I'll show the um, Jenny? No, I don't mind too much. Um, I, I will okay. admit that since, since I'm wearing a lot of the undergarments, it is only right. the yeah. month of the mannequin. <laughs> so if I could ask for people's um, mercy and forgiveness in terms of how it's being displayed, because I'm actually wearing um, all of the undergarments that I would usually have. Right. So um, yeah, there's a, there's a slightly um, out of century um, undergarment on her. So sorry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now, 
Can everybody see? That's that's looking good everybody? to me. Yeah, that's looking lovely. So this is the back um, of the garment. So again, I, if people can see properly, there's that diamond shape. So the, sh the shoulder straps, there's a seam that comes a lot further. Again, in modern times, we're used to the shoulder seam being on the very top of the shoulder. A lot of the time in the period, it, it's a lot further back. So you have it about here. And then the side seams of the garment are actually here. So you, as I said, you end up with this, they call it a diamond back. It's, a, it's more of a diamond in earlier dresses. Um, but it's a rough diamond shape from shoulder to arm to waist and then back up again. Um, the sleeves, as I said, it's not very um, obvious in this, but they do come further around the back than we would normally expect them to be on the sort of the bend of the shoulder. Um, but these um, come a little bit further back over the shoulder blades. Um, and you have, um, the sleeves are usually, um, particularly for me, they're larger than the armholes. So you end up with excess fabric um, sort of gathered into the back part here. But what that actually allows is for more arm movement, because if that was completely tight, you wouldn't be able to, you'd have a much more restricted um, movement. Um, the neckline is very basic for a day dress and um, it's a reasonably high-waisted. Um, the waist, even in the high-waisted styles, just sort of go up and down very slightly. Um, there's um, some parts where it's, it's impossibly high under the bust and it actually rises up um, across the back. Um, often, uh, as it, I'm going to say, uh, and interpret from my point of view, it's some, it will depend on the taste of the lady as well. Um, you know, there's fashion and then there's being able to wear something comfortably. Um, and so a lot of women would have um, possibly collaborated, as I said, with their dressmaker. Um, so the dressmaker would be the fashion expert, let's say, but the lady then would be the expert in how she likes to wear her own clothes um, and likes them to fit. So then underneath that, as you can see, we've got a, a, a massive amount of fabric. <laughs> Um, all very tightly gathered or pleated um, into pretty much this portion of the back. Um, there are garments, um, historical garments, where it's a much smaller um, area. Um, unfortunately, um, my body type means that it has to be spread out a little bit more. Um, and again, that's an area that would have, um, that would have varied with women at the time. Um, I know that um, there can be this idea as well that women back then were impossibly small and um, but a lot of what happens with that is that it tends to be smaller garments that end up being preserved longer for museums and um, useful garments as I've mentioned get remade reused so um, you do end up with um, a sort of a preservation bias in some museums um, where um, and to touch on it a little bit there's not a massive amount of working class clothing available. And um, again, because of the fact that it would have been recycled so heavily and reused um, and also for a long period of time. I think I think um, I can't obviously speak for historians and museum curators, but there is definitely more of an interest in the ordinary experience as opposed to maybe 50 years ago when um, what was considered most interesting were the really, really nice dresses. Um, so unfortunately, um, the, there's not always a good representation of body types or body sizes in museums necessarily, um, but it would be um, it would be foolish to say that those body types didn't exist back then and that dresses and styles weren't um, weren't altered to suit someone's proportions and things like that. Um, so returning to the dress, um, I'll just try and turn it around. Um, So the, um, on my dress in particular, the straps um, are actually a separate um, piece. They don't run the whole way from, from front to the back of the bodice. So there's a seam here as well and on the other shoulder. Um, and then the arm is much smoother. And also my mannequin's arms are a bit like that, unfortunately. So um, <laughs> there's not as much free movement as there would be if it was on a real body. Um, but they'd be a little bit flatter at the front. Now the sleeves themselves are 
very basic as would be fit a daytime style. Um, they do get fancier um, as you go through the day towards evening and they also get slightly fancier and more complicated as you go through time. Um, but generally speaking, um, you might have had um, slightly longer sleeves that could be gathered in, um, in bands. So you get this nice puffy thing the whole way down. Um, and there's, um, uh, do, do you actually have it, Madeline? The, um, I can put it up um, if you don't, the photo of Dawson Turner. Um, not not that's beside I'll, me. Actually. I'll no. put it up in a second. But um, one of his daughters in that picture has sort of these um, kind of Juliet sleeves or Mameluk sleeves, as they were called. Um, the the other thing in terms of, I suppose, the, the colonialism and the globalism thing is that you get people um, and fashions heavily influenced by these um, sort of romantic ideas um, of other countries um, and romantic ideas you get um, of other times as well. You get a lot of details um, which people interpreted older historical dress. Um, so these Juliet sleeves would have looked a little bit like sort of the type of puffing you get in um, Tudor garments and things. Um, but this one is just a very, very plain long sleeve. Um, but it's specifically made so that the sleeve comes about halfway down my hand. Um, that was considered quite fashionable at the time. And um, sometimes ladies would shape it in quite, um, quite narrow at the, at the wrist and widening out over the hand. I mean, you see it a lot in coats and things as well. Um, the, um, and this is the front then. So the front comes down. And this is how I get into it. So it's based, this is what they would call a bib front or an apron front. So the lining of the dress overlaps at the front and you could either tie it um, with ties or lace it or pin it. Um, I choose to pin it. Um, and so you, um, the openings are actually on the sides here where I've got my hands and there's another one on the other side. Um, and they come down, um, down the hip far enough for me to be able to um, fit the dress up over me or over my head. Um, I kind of shrug it on um, with the sleeves almost like uh, putting on a coat. Um, you cross the, the flaps over at the front and pin them in place. Um, there's a string attached around the waist, so I, I tie it around the back. Um, it goes from the, the side of the front panel here, the skirt panel goes, so it's almost like this kind of a shape. So there's the bib and then the skirt panel extends out to the side. Um, and I have a, a, a string which then is tied around the back and you see this in extant garments as well. Um, and then, as I said, there is um, uh, the, 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 the false front then covers over that lining. Um, and these are extremely common. You would have had um, different shapes of false front. You could have a, a fake crossover front. Um, I've seen examples where um, the skirt is detached from the bodice and it's got a, a crossover front that hangs loose completely. Um, but this would have been um, a pretty common way of doing things, uh, particularly early on in the Regency. Um, and then as you get into the 1810s, you start to see more back lacing ones um, rather than the front lacing ones or the front tying ones. Um, I particularly um, like the front tying ones because I can get dressed myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> And that's absolutely lovely. That's terrific, Kerry. It's one of the things that you realise when you have a dress that ties at the back is that you have to have help. And whether that help either comes from a, a relative, like a sister, or a housemaid, if you have a housemaid. Um, but it's, it's, it's extremely difficult um, to try and get into a back lacing dress on your own. So. Great, great. Well, thank you ever so much for all of that, Kerry. That was absolutely splendid. The session and your extra on the questions. Now I wanted to show um, the Curious Ladies Guide, just a little peek, sneak, uh, sneak peek of this. This is from our uh, festival designer, um, Jenny Dempsey. And this is book one, which is out and available online and um, bought in places in Bantry and Cork. And it is absolutely delightful. It's a guide to running a dinner party in the 1780s. Um, and the second book is due out very soon and you're all going to get your special treat 
in just a day or two of the pre-publication couple of pages. But look at this, it's absolute delight. It's sort of like sneak history lesson. It's, it's, like, um, it's like a beautiful magazine to browse through. It's a visual delight. It's got an enormous amount of information in it. So you're learning a huge amount in a sort of a sneaky way. And the illustrations, the designs are just absolutely splendid. Um, Jenny has a, a wonderful, wonderful eye for things. So that's, um, that's another little piece of what we're doing. The festival finishes Ellen Hutchins Festival. And sorry, some of you had a difficulty getting in at the start. So just to say, I'm Madeline Hutchins. I'm one of the co-organizers of the Ellen Hutchins Festival, which is usually in Bantry, but online this year. Um, and I'm Ellen's great, great grand niece. Um, and I've been researching her, as I said, about the letters. Um, the festival has one more day. There's a competition tomorrow. So if you have time still to write a poem, a piece of prose, take a plant photo or a drawing, um, and the prose could be influenced by Ellen's life or by the natural heritage on your doorstep. The deadline is five o'clock tomorrow. Do have a look on the website for that. Um, and I, I just finished by saying a huge thank you again to Carrie. That really was splendid. Huge amount of information and huge amount of interest and all the work you clearly put in on picking the pictures and everything for us. That was great. And thank you to everyone who's joined us this afternoon or whatever time of day it is where you are. Um, thanks for being part of it all today. And last word to Carrie. So yes, I just want to echo Madeline's um, thanks uh, for paying attention um, and for sticking around and hopefully it wasn't too much information. Um, I do, I, I'm open to contact. Um, if people have further questions that they'd like to ask, um, I would like, as I said at the start, though, just to emphasize that um, I am not a historian. Um, so um, a lot of where um, my experience would come would be from making these things and wearing these things myself um, and the uh, research that I would do in my in my spare time. Um, but if people would like um, to um, forward on I, I can leave an email address um that we can push um up uh it's uh carrie c-a-r-r-i-e o'flynn at gmail.com and um i can take uh questions that people might have extra to the session here because i know we're wrapping up now so yeah just thank thank you for um thank you for everything <laughs>